Let me just begin by reading this passage from John 17, verses 25 and 26. I think I've read this one the last couple of times we met together to study the Holy Spirit. Again, I think it's a very interesting verse, John 17, actually two verses, from uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer, what we um, would call his high priestly prayer on behalf of his church. He says this, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now again, the uh, the point being that uh, the love with which the Father loves (coughs) the Son, we've seen, is essentially the love of God is the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit might dwell within God's people, And Jesus says that I might dwell in them as well. We're going to see there's really quite a very close correlation between those two things uh, this evening. Uh, I really am hoping to get through all the material that I have here this evening, so I'm just going to review quickly what we've seen and uh, not ask by way of questions. Uh, First of all, we've seen the Holy Spirit is a person, that He is a divine person, that He is a distinct person from the Father and the Son, and that He is called the Spirit because He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Uh, in Edward's view, He is the love of God that the, well, that the Father has for the Son and that the Son has for the Father. And His role in redemption actually uh, reflects that particular nature, that He is sent by the Father and the Son to apply the work uh, that Jesus Christ has done and essentially to unite himself to our souls and to work this nature in us. By the way, I should mention, you know, we've spent over the past couple of months a lot of time studying the Trinity, actually. And it's interesting how um, just lately two members of the church have come in contact with those who are involved with people who are involved in churches that are anti-Trinitarian. Uh, so the Lord has been providentially arranging the, uh, the use of this information to help others. Uh, it's something that's not just academic, but uh, something that uh, would um, help us to help other people find their way out of cults and into the truth. Okay, so we, um, as we began to look at the work of the Holy Spirit, we did begin with His work of regeneration, realizing that... Um, Excuse me. <clears throat> when we came into the world, we were spiritually dead. Again, not physically dead, but spiritually dead, which means we wanted nothing to do with God. We had no love for Him. Um, because of Adam's sin, because of the loss of the Holy Spirit, um, Adam could not pass on to us what he doesn't have. So this, basically, Christ is the one who comes and He does what the first Adam failed to do, and he brings the Spirit of God back. The Spirit of God is the one who actually makes us alive, the one who raised you from the dead by uniting himself to your soul. Now, let me just ask you this question because I think this is the most basic question I could ask in the things that we've seen so far. What is the one thing that you were lacking in your spiritual darkness and your spiritual death? The one thing you were lacking that actually prevented you from trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? It is the Spirit, of course, but what is it that the Spirit of God actually does to enable you to trust in the Lord? Right? Okay, He he does give you faith, that's right. And uh, what, what is it that He does to give you that faith, if I can put it that way? What is the basis of that faith? What is it that makes you want to trust in Jesus? Okay, he does open your eyes. Um, you're on the right track. Um, what, what is the, um, the basic principle or the, um, let's say, the overarching characteristic of um, the Spirit of God? What is it that, um, in the opening verse that I just read? Love, Love right. Uh, the reason why we, we uh, want to um, put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason why we want to exercise faith, is because the Spirit of God actually gives us a love for something we used to hate. 
Uh, there are people who can believe what the Bible says is true. They can believe the facts. They can know that Jesus is who he said he, he was or is, and, uh, but yet they still won't come to him because they don't want him. So you need to have love, and that's what the Spirit of God does. So basically, the Bible represents this as spiritual resurrection. Uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were completely averse to God. We loved the darkness. But the Spirit of God changes our hearts and makes us love the Lord so that we'll come. But again, does the work of the Holy Spirit end with the impartation of this love and this work of regeneration? Uh, not really, although in a certain sense, that's all he needs to do to accomplish what it is that he intends to accomplish. However, there are things we need to do to promote his work in our hearts and not to quench it and so forth. I think we understand that uh, by now. But regeneration is where it begins. Now, tonight we want to look at uh, sanctification. Uh, if we could summarize it, what exactly is the Spirit of God wanting to do in your life? What is his goal? What is his purpose or his aim? Yes? That's exactly right. He is the author of holiness, and his work is to make us holy. And I think you'll, um, you'll find that if you were to talk to broad evangelical Christians, that uh, many of them are completely unaware of that and think that really the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is simply to, in, <clears throat> excuse me, to inhabit you after you've, tr after you've trusted in Jesus Christ and basically to assure you that you are God's child and that's it. He doesn't aim to produce holiness or to change your life at all. Uh, sadly, there's a number of professing Christians who believe that. And of course, if their life isn't transformed, then they're not saved. Because if the Spirit of God is in you, He will produce this fruit. Uh, maybe we could turn up Ephesians um, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. I think it gives us a... Um, a very straightforward answer to the question, what exactly is God aiming at in this work of redemption? Did he send Jesus into the world just to save you from hell? I mean, is that it? Uh, just to save you from guilt so that you wouldn't have to suffer for an eternity? Certainly he does that. But is that all he was aiming at? Did he intend to leave you as he found you? Uh, many professing Christians believe that to be true. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6 um, I, I guess for the sake of the recording, I should probably just read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So according to this passage, what was God's purpose in choosing us specifically? That we, that we would be holy and blameless. Now, you know, if you, again, ask uh, you know, most Christians, most professing Christians today what this passage means, they would say that God chose you because you were holy and blameless, because he looked ahead and saw that you would trust in Jesus Christ. And by trusting in him, you would be you know, forgiven and you would be made uh, perfect in Christ. And God, seeing that you were going to make that choice, chose you. He chose you because you were holy and blameless. But is, um, is that what Paul is actually saying here? Uh, what, is, what is Paul saying? He chose us in order that we might be, come holy and blameless. So his choice actually brings about the result holy and blameless. It's not he chooses us because we become holy and blameless. He chooses us so that we might become holy and blameless in Christ. So he's the one who does, the, obviously, the choosing. Now, how do you become holy and blameless? 
And what's the only way that you can become holy and blameless? By trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that means that God chose you to believe so that you can become holy and blameless. He chose you that you might become this way. This is the only way you can become this way, by trusting in Christ and turning from your sins. That's what God chose you for. Now, do you think, though, that God's intention and what Paul was referring to here means that God chose you so you could trust in Jesus Christ and have your sins removed but still go on living the way that you used to live? Is that what he means? Um, that somehow perfection and this holiness and this blamelessness is only positionally in Christ and it doesn't actually work itself out in your life at all? Do you think that God intends that you become holy in this life? Now, we, we are only blameless in a, in a certain way, and that is certainly in Christ, but I do believe that the Lord intends that we become holy in this life. Um, Jonathan Edwards, you know, would talk about the fact that um, God doesn't just take an abject sinner and leave him that way and then bring him to heaven someday. He, he indicated the, uh, if the person has no love for holiness on earth, he certainly won't want to be with the Lord in heaven. So there's this idea of preparing us for heaven, uh, weaning us from our love for sin, giving us a love for holiness, and preparing us for what heaven is like. I do believe that um, most, well, at least, at least the, the particular camp that, that I was schooled in, believe that if you became uh, a uh, disciple, uh, if you took this seriously and actually wanted to serve the Lord on earth, then you, you will be transformed little by little. But they don't believe it's necessary. They do believe in some cases it's just a, a bang from actually being uh, going as far as becoming an enemy of Christ to being, as it were, torn from the earth and brought into heaven. Um, as a matter of fact, they say anybody who's ever prayed the prayer, and they believe that to be exercising faith, you know, uh, that that person could um, spend the rest of their life trying to tear the church down and they're still going to heaven. So quite a different view than I think what the Bible is teaching. Now, here's, here's another passage, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, which um, I think helps us to zero in a little bit more on exactly what the Spirit of God is intending to do in our lives. Romans chapter 8, 29 through 30, I think a very familiar passage. And I do believe it's just another way of stating what we've already seen, that He chose us that we might be holy and blameless. So look at what He says here. For those whom He foreknew... He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called, and these whom He called, He also justified, and these whom He justified, He also glorified. So again, we've seen that God chose us that we might be holy and blameless. Here it says that He predestined us in order that we might what? be conformed into whose image? Yeah, Christ's image. And what is Christ's image? Except holy and blameless. And again, you know, uh, the same kind of confusion surrounds this verse as it does around the other verse. What does it mean that God foreknew? Um, and they'll say, well, God foreknew what your choice was going to be. And and those whom He foresaw were going to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He predestined them to become conformed to the image of His Son and so forth. But again, if God were to look ahead down the corridors of time and look at you apart from His grace, you know, He just looks at you, what you're doing, the way you came into this world with that particular nature, what is He going to see you doing? Nothing good, but only sinning, because the Bible says there is none who seeks for God. And so this isn't really talking about what God foresees you're going to be doing. I mean, He foresees that everybody's going to be sinning, because that's all we can do apart from His grace. Again, the Bible says no one seeks after God.
But we do know the idea of foreknown is that of foreloving. God foreloves or loves in advance those whom he will. That's the same thing as choosing. He chooses whom he's going to set his affections on, and he predestines those to be holy and blameless or to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, when does this transformation actually take place? This transformation is being conformed to the image of the son. Is it, is it as we just thought about how certain believers look at this, it's sort of, you know, you're living the same kind of life or you're becoming increasingly wicked and suddenly, bang, you're conformed into the image of Christ. It happens when you die all at once. You're sort of drawn up into heaven and though you hated God before, now you suddenly love him. Is that the way it works? Or does this conformity begin on earth in order to make us fit for heaven? I would certainly think so. Actually, we're going to look at that verse in a little bit. Yes. Now, okay, this, this is what God has chosen us for. This is his goal uh, to make us holy and blameless. This is his goal to conform us to the image of his son. How exactly does God do that? He does it through the work of the Holy Spirit. And why does he use the Spirit of God? Well, because the Spirit of God is love. And by the way, uh, we, we noted just a moment ago that uh, the Holy Spirit is the author of holiness and he makes us holy. But what is holiness in its essence? What, is, what does it mean to be holy? Okay, Th that's certainly true. Set apart from the world to the Lord. It also means to be set apart from sin to what is good. Would you say that if you, if you keep the law of God, that that would keep you, if you could, would that keep you separate from sin? Okay, and what is the fulfillment of the law? Love, Love. right. So the author of holiness, the Holy Spirit, simply produces this principle of love in our hearts. He gives us a love for what is good and right, and that's how he works holiness. Now, here we're, we're just going to um, uh, spend the rest of our time looking at something that um, I thought was somewhat interesting. And um, when we consider that the work of the Holy Spirit is to make us holy and blameless, and the work of the Holy Spirit is to conform us into the image of Christ, not just in heaven, although that's where it's going to be perfected, but also on earth, it, it's interesting that that work that the Spirit of God is doing in us is the same work that the Holy Spirit actually did in Christ himself. And I know we have to be a little bit careful about how we, uh, how we put this. Uh, after all, Jesus is the Son of God in human flesh, it's, it's the second person of the triune God. And certainly we believe that person to have a love for holiness. It's interesting how uh, Jonathan Edwards construes uh, this, how this union between the two natures actually takes place and does so consistently with his view of who the Holy Spirit is. But let's, let's take a look at that. But let's, let's look at one verse first of all. John 3, verse 34. John 3, verse 34. Let me just uh, read it, and then I'll ask you if you'd like to take a crack at what it means. <coughs> okay, this is, what, um, this is what Jesus says, I believe. For he whom God has sent, or maybe it could be John the Baptist, I don't have my red letter edition in front of me. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Okay, so let's, let's consider what this means first of all. I think the first part of it is obvious, okay? For he whom God has sent, who, who is the one God has sent? Jesus, right? And what is it that Jesus speaks? Uh, the words of God, okay. Now, why does he speak the words of God? Is the reason given in the verse? There is a four there. Is a, what is, a, okay. Right, for he gives the spirit without measure. Now, what does that mean, that he gives the spirit without measure?
First of all, who is the he that's being spoken of here? Okay, it could be God or it could, um, could be Christ, but I think it is God. Okay, why would we think that it's God and not Jesus? Of course, we don't have the Greek in front of us and, and perhaps it would look differently if we did, but in English. <clears throat> So context would, would determine that. And in, in English grammar, um, when you have a pronoun, what, what is it generally referring to? Not always, but usually. Okay, it, it's closest antecedent noun, okay? So in this case, it's God, okay? So, but again, contextually, the argument is... Um, why is it that Christ speaks the word of God? Well, this is an explanation, right? Because he, that is God, gives the spirit without measure. Now, that sounds rather general. What does it mean he gives the spirit without measure? God is in heaven giving the spirit without measure. Therefore, Christ speaks the word of God. What's the connection? <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, okay, he gives the spirit to Christ. That would be the, um, the reason, or at least that would be consistent with what's going on here. Why does Jesus speak the words of God? Because God gives the spirit to him without measure. Can you imagine God giving the spirit without measure to anyone else? I mean, are you, does Jesus, I mean, if this were Jesus, does he give the spirit without measure? Uh, if he does, I think we've all, kind of missed out on a certain portion of that because we don't have the spirit without measure. We're kind of struggling along with the measure we have. But what about Jesus? Was he struggling along with only parts of the spirit's work or is this saying that, that Jesus was filled with the spirit without measure? Now here's, here's the important point to notice and this is what Edwards I believe is keyed in on. The reason why Jesus speaks the word of God is because he has been given the Spirit of God without measure by the Father. Now that seems, it seems like it could be a bit strange and there may be different ways we could understand this. Uh, why isn't Jesus speaking the words of God? Because he's the second person of the Godhead in human flesh. Or because he's the divine logos, the, the reason of God or the word of God made flesh. Why isn't that the reason rather than he gives the spirit without measure or that he's been anointed with the spirit above measure? Edward saw a connection between this work of the Holy Spirit and the words that Jesus is speaking. And again, we can think of it in different terms. I mean, Jesus in his humanity, did he have all knowledge, all divine knowledge in his humanity? Uh, he didn't, okay? He had a limited, finite human mind that didn't know everything. So when he spoke the word of God and, and this knowledge comes, the spirit of God is giving him that knowledge or he's speaking through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, but who is it ultimately that is speaking through Jesus? Okay, God is, but if, if we understand... The, um, you know, what the scriptures say about the Spirit and whose word he actually reveals. I mean, whose word is the Spirit communicating to Jesus in order to communicate with us? It is God, but it's a little more specific. It would be the, the Logos, right? Or, or the second person of the triune God or the person who is the person, the divine person, as it were. Okay? Whose person is the same as the human person. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange, so... Uh, Edwards actually develops that a little bit, and let, let's just back up just for a moment and consider the Spirit's work in bringing Jesus into the world in the first place. I mean, was um, what we, we know that the, the virgin birth was, was unique, and that was Christ's unique entrance into the world. Who was it that conceived this human nature uh, in the womb of the virgin? Okay, it was the Holy Spirit. And we're very familiar with the passage in Luke 1.35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Okay, it was the Spirit of God, but why was it the Spirit who actually did this? Why was the Spirit the one given this task? Can you think of a reason? Okay. Well, you've just actually said a couple of different things. The first one was, was along the lines of what I'm looking for, okay, because the human nature would be tainted with sin. That, that had to be removed, didn't it? It had to be circumvented, didn't it? And even though um, the guilt of Adam would be, I, I believe, transmitted through a father and there was no human father, yet Mary herself, although Rome would deny this, Mary was a sinner and she needed a savior. And so anything connected with her would likely be something that's touched with sin. And so the Spirit of God works in order to sanctify this child and make this child holy. By the way, he was also, um, it was also the Spirit of God because, well, actually this wouldn't be a good explanation for why it was the Spirit, but the Spirit conceived this child so that the child might be the Son of God, although why didn't the Father do it? Why did the Spirit so that the child might be holy. This is what Edwards writes. Christ, although he was conceived in the womb of one of fallen mankind, yet he was conceived without sin because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, which is divine love and holiness itself. Do you see that um, connection with what we've been looking at? And again, how Edwards is consistently applying this principle and it tends to make sense. He says, that which infinite holiness and love immediately forms, it is impossible that it should have any sin. And remember that what was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary was a complete whole human nature. It was not just a body, but also a soul. And we do know that uh, the Son of God, the second person of the, of the Godhead, the divine Logos, the Word of God, is the person of that human nature, but uh, again, uh, there, there needed this work to be done in order that this one, and this, this whole human nature might be conceived without sin. Okay, the author of holiness again, conceiving him in this, not just without guilt, but what's the other sense in which Jesus was holy? I mean, he was, he was blameless, right? But what's the other sense in which he was holy? Remember, there's, there's two, uh, two senses when, when God forgives us of our sins. That's, that's one part of his work, but there's the other part of it that we're sort of emphasizing here. The other part of holiness. Yeah. Holiness could be blamelessness, yes? Okay, that, that might be the same thing, though, as, as like a positional holiness. He's blameless, he's guiltless, but what else is he if he's holy? Well, uh, hopefully we're holy, but not, but not God, so it can't be that. But what, what exactly is holiness again? Are you talking about perfect holiness? What's that? Are you talking about perfect holiness? Well, it certainly, it certainly would be perfect holiness, Brian. He's sinless. He's what? Sinless. Well, again, that would be... Um, that would be the fact he doesn't have any guilt. So let me just state it. <laughs> what, what would his heart be like? Full of love. Full of love, okay. So he's not only conceived blameless or without guilt, but he's also conceived with this perfect love for God. Okay, so this is the work the Spirit of God has done. Now, this idea of when, when is Jesus actually anointed with the Spirit above measure, I think that, that Edwards, and, and I'm not sure if he could prove it one way or the other, but I've understood that to mean that when he, was, when he presented himself to Israel for his baptism and the Spirit of God descends from heaven, that that was his anointing for his ministry and that's when he was anointed with the Spirit above measure. But I think Edwards is indicating that he believes that this happened at the conception and remained that way throughout life and that there was a reason why that happened. Um, so anyway, let, let's just take a look at that for a minute. 
Now, it says that he was anointed with the Spirit above measure. Certainly, that was to fulfill prophecy and so forth, and it was certainly to equip him for his ministry. But Edwards has this um, unique view of uh, the, the hypostatic union, which is, I know is a fancy word that we maybe we haven't heard. Maybe we have heard. Does anybody know what the hypostatic union is? <laughs> okay. Christ has two natures, right? And those two natures are united together. But where, where are they united? Okay. Are they united to each other? Are his divine and human natures um, stuck together? Okay, no, they're not, they're not united together in, in each other, but, but they are united. So what are they united in? Does anybody have any idea? Okay, well, no, not necessarily in a human body, no. Well, they're united in the person. Okay, there's a person who is the second person of the Godhead who has two natures, and he, he possesses both, and they, they are basically united by the fact that they are possessed by one person. Okay? Now, that's usually, again, uh, how far, I suppose, historic theology has, has mentioned, you know, that this, this is where the union takes place of these two natures. They're not, I mean, there's, there was a lot of debate in the ancient church about how the two natures actually relate to each other. And as you know, Martin Luther had a bit of a confusion uh, in that relating to the two natures. Does anybody remember what Luther's uh, issue was, what, what he uh, disagrees with, with historic Christendom on? Has to do with the Lord's Supper? Okay, so he believed in a real presence of Christ at the table. So now Luther knew and, and he was challenged. If, if, if you have several churches celebrating the Lord's Supper at one time and Christ is really there, present physically, so that we're eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and Luther believed that we were doing that, um, how can that be? And what was his explanation? Does anybody remember? How can his human nature be in all these places at one time? What, what would have to be true of his human nature? It would have to be omnipresent. omnipresent. He called it ubiquitous, okay, which is basically the same thing. It's everywhere at once. His flesh and blood is everywhere. I mean, it's, it's here. You know, as I push my hand through it, it's in the chair. It's permeating you. It's basically everywhere. It's around the world. It fills the universe. And of course, Calvin, you know, Calvin wasn't altogether uncritical of Luther. He did believe Luther to be a, a Christian and, and even uh, exercising a prophetic role of declaring God's will. And we, the church needed this kind of person. But he, he thought about Luther's doctrine. And he said, well, this is strange flesh and blood that fills the universe, you know, and yet I can walk across the room and, and not be hindered by it. Um, the, the problem, though, is that you have a divine attribute that's communicated to his human nature. Uh, and that's something that mixes the two natures together. And if you have a human nature that becomes ubiquitous or becomes omnipresent, it's no longer a human nature. Now it's something that's a composite between divine and human. But the fact is that Christ is fully God and fully man. And he's not a combination of both. So the, again, the idea is that the, the natures don't combine together to create something uh, differently. So again, these two natures are combined in the one person, and the question that Edward sought to explain with regard to his being anointed with the Spirit, and this connection between the two natures, he, he was asking the question, how does the person of, of the second person of the Godhead, how does that person actually get united to that human nature? Uh, where does that take place? How does that take place? Well, he believes that it actually took place by this anointing, by the Holy Spirit above measure. The Spirit of God was the one who actually caused that identity of personality. And this is getting pretty out there, but between the second person of the Godhead and that human nature. Let me just read to you what he, what he says here. The creature is more or less holy according as it has more or less of the Holy Spirit dwelling in it. 
But Christ has so much of the Spirit and has it in so high and excellent a manner as to render him the same person with him whose spirit it is. Did you get the point there? This is the spirit of Christ. And he so fills the human nature of Christ that it causes the person of that human nature to be the same person as the spirit. Now, we'd all have to recognize there is some way in which the personality of Christ is connected I mean, the personality of the Son of God is connected to that human nature. And what Edwards is saying is it's because of this filling of the Holy Spirit, it's because of this anointing above measure that enables him to speak the words of God because he has the Spirit of God, because God or the Father has given him the Spirit above measure. So basically what makes Jesus to be you know, the person there to be the divine person is the fact that he's anointed with the spirit above measure. The spirit of God, as it were, communicates that personality to that human nature. And actually, that, um, if that's true, then it is um, interesting some of the, um, the applications of that to us because who dwells in us if we are uh, true believers? Holy Spirit dwells in us. And what have we already seen that the Holy Spirit is, is seeking to do in us to make us holy and blameless like, like, what did you say? Like, yeah, like, like Jesus Christ, okay? Now, it does tend to add new dimensions to these passages, such as the fact that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we know the Spirit of God dwells in us, and the fact that we are partakers of the divine nature, which we saw in um, 2 Peter 1, verse 4. By the way, um, well, we'll get to this in just a moment, but let's, let's paint the picture of a Christian. Okay, a Christian in Scripture is called the temple of God because uh, Paul, well, Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? Christians have the Spirit of God dwelling in them and so they are called temples. Uh, scripture says because the Spirit of God dwells within us that we are partakers of the divine nature. We saw this last time in 2 Peter 1 verse 4. For by these he, grant, he has granted to us his prescience and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. We know that, uh, that Peter doesn't mean that we're little gods, you know, like dogs beget dogs and cats beget cats, so God begets gods. We're not little gods, but we do share the divine nature somehow. And he's talking about this love for holiness, this nature of the Holy Spirit that he's working within us. The Spirit of God is the one who writes the law of God on our hearts. Hebrews 8.10, quoting uh, Jeremiah in the New Covenant, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, bear with me for a minute. I'm going to come back to what we just saw. Okay, he dwells in us for the temple of the Spirit. We partake of his nature. He writes his law on our hearts, which means he gives us a love for the law, which in essence gives us the power to live according to the law of God. And again, broad evangelicalism would say that's legalism. I had a gentleman tell me that the other evening. That's legalism you know, to say that you have to keep the law. Well, the, he, the Spirit of God actually produces a love for the law of God so that you want to keep it because that's why God saved you, it is not just so you can take you to heaven, but so that you can become holy on earth and be like his son. So this writing the law on the heart gives you the power to live according to the law. Uh, Paul says in Romans 8, verses 2 through 4, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The fact is the spirit of God actually 
gives us the power to live according to the commandments and to do it not against our will, but to do it with pleasure. Again, I wanted to try to finish this this evening. That's why I'm kind of rushing through this part, but hopefully it'll all make sense in a moment. John says in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay. So again, the spirit of God dwells within us. He produces this nature within us. He writes the law of God on our hearts. He gives us the power to walk according to that law and to do it joyfully. But isn't that a description of somebody we know very well who is precisely, we could describe him in these terms. And that, of course, is Jesus, the very image of the one that the Spirit of God is working within us. Now, again, the idea is this, that the Spirit of God so fills the human nature of Christ that he actually identifies him with the second person of the triune God. He, in essence, is made to be that same person. Okay? When the Spirit of God dwells in us, He's actually producing that same kind of nature inside of us, not exactly. I mean, we're you know, just a shadow of what Jesus Christ is. But, um, and he doesn't transform our personality necessarily in the sense that we know are no longer our own. But I would say that as the Spirit of God works within our hearts, we all begin to bear a remarkable resemblance to Jesus Christ in the way that we behave. And eventually, I suppose you might say, we'd all begin to think and act as Jesus does. Uh, that is perfection after all. We're still going to be conscious of who we are, but we're going to act and behave one day like Jesus when we're in heaven. But again, I wanted to just draw this correlation. The Spirit of God dwells within us, but Jesus basically said of himself that he is the temple of God and who dwells in the temple except the Spirit of God. Remember how Jesus says, destroy this temple? And in three days, I will raise it up. And they said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, Jesus is the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in him. The Spirit of God dwells in us. We become the temple of God. Uh, does Jesus share the same nature as the Father? Obviously. Jesus, or Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, does Jesus have the law of God written on his heart? Uh, Psalm 40, verses 7 through 8. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Did Jesus live according to the law of God? Certainly. He said to the Pharisees, which one of you convicts me of sin? And did Jesus take pleasure in obeying God's law? Well, certainly on one occasion he challenged, well, uh, okay, uh, he, he did say to his disciples on one occasion, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So basically, when the psalmist says, speaking of basically Jesus speaking through the psalmist, talking about what he was going to be like in his earthly ministry, he says, behold, I come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. So basically, what we see is true of Jesus Christ is actually true of believers as well. When the Spirit of God dwells within us, He begins to work that same nature in us. He begins to write, well, He writes the law of God in our hearts. He gives us a desire to walk according to the law of God, the power to do it, and the desire to do it. He is working within us that same image that was in our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and it also makes sense of passages like this where Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And when Paul is speaking to the Colossians, he talks about the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, Jesus Christ is said to dwell in the believer, and the way he does is by his Holy Spirit, who is actually transforming us into the image of the one whose spirit it is. In other words, transforming us into the likeness of Christ in a very similar way 
that he filled Jesus Christ, as it were, the, the human nature of Christ, and made him to be the same person as the, the Son of God. So anyway, that's, that's basically what I wanted us to see, is that uh, the Spirit of God's work is to enter into us and to make us holy and blameless. Uh, he is the one who is going to conform us into the image of the Son of God in order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. What do you, what do you think he means by that? Just people? You know, he, he, we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ so that Jesus would be the firstborn among many who are like him. Right? So the Spirit of God is making us to be like Jesus so that he would have many brethren. So again, this is basically what um, we, we heard a little bit earlier when Greg brought up this passage as far as the Spirit's work in transforming us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and I would say liberty from sin. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So basically, we have it all summed up here. The work of the Spirit of God is to make us like Jesus. Um, even as he did that in the human nature of Christ, so he is doing that within us, to make us holy and blameless, to conform us to his image, that, we might, um, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, of course, the practical application of that is, is this, that if the Spirit of God is in you, then he will be transforming your life. You will be becoming more like Jesus Christ. Sadly, it isn't all going to be in one shot. You know, it's not going to happen all in a bang, and suddenly, you know, we walk through a door and we're like Christ. And it's not going to be perfect in this life. We're going to go through a lot of struggles. And we're still going to sin quite a bit, sadly. But one day it will be perfected when we are with the Lord in, in glory. So we need to be thankful about, uh, about that. But how do we know that we belong to the Lord? It's because Christ's image is being formed in us. Now let me ask you this question based upon what we saw earlier, what we talked about a little bit earlier. What if you have a person who went forward at an altar call and who prayed the prayer and then his life was unchanged or he just kept on living the way that he was living? What do you think about a person who doesn't repent? What do you think about a person who um, spends the rest of his life trying to tear down the church? Is that person a believer? Is he going to go to heaven when he dies, if he dies in that state? A person who has no interest in Christ, who has no desire to serve him, no, you know, no desire to honor him, is not of the same spirit as Christ, who delighted to do the will of the Father, whose meat and drink was to carry out his, his purposes. No, I mean, it's the furthest thing from what the Lord intends for us to be. He chose us that we might be holy and blameless. He chose us to be conformed to the image of his Son. That transformation needs to be going on in us at some level or we're, we're not true believers. And every, every believer will have something of it. And again, we can choke it out. We can, we can weaken the Spirit's work and so forth. We're actually going to look a little bit more at that this upcoming Lord's Day evening. There are certain things that we need to do to grow in love. In other words, to get more of the Spirit because if what we've just seen is true... The more you have of the Spirit of God, the more you're going to be like someone we know very well and love, I hope, very much, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The more we grieve and quench the Spirit, the less we're going to be like Jesus. The more we are filled with the Spirit of God, the more we are going to be like Jesus because He is working Jesus' character in us, the, the, the image of the one whose Spirit He is, the Spirit of Christ. So... Um, that is the work of the Spirit of God, and it is His peculiar work because He is, as we saw at the very beginning, the love of God. Going back to that very first verse, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. 
And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. I mean, Christ literally is in us, and he is uh, not only in us, but he's actually being formed in us. It sounds like a passage of Scripture, doesn't it? Uh, Paul is, is saying, oh, my children, how I am in labor for you, that, you know, that Christ be formed in you. Well, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? That we become like Jesus Christ. So if you have the Spirit of God, you'll be becoming more like Jesus Christ, or you're like Him to some degree now. And the more you have of the Spirit of God, the more you'll be like Him, the less you have the Spirit, the less you'll be like Him. And again, one thing we need to bear in mind is, um, as one, one Bible teacher once said, actually, in, in that, um, well, in that whole line of thinking that's, that I was criticizing earlier, you know, that you can be a Christian and not grow at all. They, they did believe that um, if you're a disciple, you will be. And what he said in this case was true. He says it takes a lot of work to grow in the Lord, but he says, I never cease to be amazed how little it takes to go back to square one. All it takes is perhaps one sin and, boof, you know, you're back down. But the labor to get back up is, is difficult. So it's difficult to go up, it's easy to go down. I mean, that's, that's the way it is, isn't it? If you're climbing a hill, it's hard to go up it, it's easy to go down it. And that's the way it is in the Christian life as well. It's not equal, I would say. You don't just take one step and you're up, you know, up to perfect sanctification and then one step you're down, but it's a hard road up and an easy road down. So that's why we need to guard what we have of the Spirit of God and seek to gain more of it, uh, more of Him, I should say, through the means of grace. Because if you love Jesus Christ, you want to be like Him. The more you have of the Spirit of God, the more you'll be like Him because He is the love of God in our souls. Any, um, any questions about that? Comments, questions? All right, then let's um, bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and by His grace put it into practice. Let's pray.